Well, good morning. Do keep your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be taking a look at that in just a few moments. But before we do, let's bow our heads to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And as we open it together this morning, Father, would you give us ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts that are ready to be changed by you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you want to be happy? Do you want to be happy? Of course you do. We all want to be happy. And yet happiness is such an elusive thing. It can at times be hard to find and even harder to hold on to. You know the feeling. You have that moment where everything's perfect and you just want to freeze time. You want to live in that moment forever because you know the moment will pass and the happiness will fade. We want to be happy. A few months ago, I was listening to a surfing podcast where various characters from the surfing community are interviewed. At the end of each interview is the lightning round. And the final question was this. Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by... If I was to ask you that question this morning, how would you finish that sentence? I will next achieve a state of happiness by? How do we achieve a state of happiness? Well, that's what we're gonna be looking at in Matthew chapter five, because in this passage, Jesus shows us how to be truly happy. Now, before we get to that, we must take note of the opening two verses. Look with me at verse one and two. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Now, this might seem like a simple retelling of what happened, but oh, there is so much more to it than that. You see, if you've been following along with us over the past few weeks as we've looked at Exodus, you will remember that it was on the mountainside that God, through Moses, gave his law to his people. Moses came down the mountainside with the Ten Commandments. Here in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus goes up the mountain. He sits down taking the posture of a teacher. His disciples, those who were following him, well, they, they followed him up the mountain. And what does Jesus do? Verse 2, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Jesus didn't go up the side of the mountain to get a message from God. He speaks by his own authority, the authority of God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. Jesus is demonstrating not only that he is the prophet like Moses, but that he is greater than Moses, in that he speaks directly as God. He is the perfect promised prophet. So when we see Jesus sitting down on the mountainside addressing his disciples, we ought to take note, we ought to pay attention we ought to draw the conclusion that this is hugely significant. And what we're going to be looking at in the next few weeks in the Sermon on the Mount, recorded in Matthew chapter 5 to 7, really is monumental. Jesus lays out life as a disciple. So what is a disciple? Well, last week, we took a look at Psalm 1. And Trevor Archer helped us to see that in this life, there are only really two ways of living. There's God's way which leads to blessing and happiness that comes from God, both now and for eternity. That is the life of a disciple, one who goes God's way. On the other hand, we can go our own way, a way that leads to judgment and ultimately perishing in hell. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is addressing his disciples, those who are going God's way. And in verse 3 to 12, we see the address to the disciples. You see, we cannot seek true happiness or blessing from God by trying to live out what is being taught in these verses if we have not first turned to God in repentance and faith. This morning, you might be listening as a disciple, or it might be that you're one of the crowd. You're just listening in to see what all the fuss is about. If that's you, can I thank you for tuning in? I hope that you'll stick with us, because I hope that by the end of this morning, You will want to join the disciples, join with those who've turned to God, because we are going to see that that is the only way to be truly happy, both now and forever. So come with me to Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 to 12. We're going to look at this in three parts. 
First, we're going to see that true happiness comes from depending on God, verses 3 to 6. Then, true happiness comes from living for God, verses 7 to 9. And finally, true happiness comes from suffering for God, verses 10 to 12. Firstly, true happiness comes from depending on God. Verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but with all this build-up about being happy, this first verse doesn't sound very promising. When was the last time you heard someone using the word poor as a motivation towards happiness? And you know what? The poor here doesn't even mean not having very much. It means absolutely stone broke. So poor that you have to depend solely on the provision of others. Now, it's not talking about financial poverty, but a poverty of spirit. Jesus lays the claim that there is blessing, happiness, for those who are spiritually stone broke. Well, how can that be? Well, let me tell you by way of illustration. Many years ago, there lived a man named Cedric. He ran a fairly successful business and things were going pretty well until disaster struck. His shop was flooded out. He lost everything and things went from bad to worse. And soon enough, he found himself begging on the streets of London for whatever scraps he could get. One day, as he sat on the street corner, he saw a smartly dressed gent walking towards him, wearing a bowler hat and carrying an umbrella under his arm. Thinking, well, there's really nothing to lose, Cedric called out to the gent, spare a penny for the poor. Cedric expected the man just to look away, but the gent turned to him and said, but you don't want that. I'm a millionaire. There is plenty of room in my home for you. Why don't you come home with me? Cedric couldn't believe what was happening to him, and as quick as a flash, he agreed. The gent looked, took him to his home, and it was an absolute mansion, the biggest house that Cedric had ever laid his eyes on. The gent took him to his home and said to him, as they entered the front door, come in. I will treat you as a son. I will provide you with everything that you need. You will lack nothing ever again. In an instant, Cedric's life had gone from rags to riches. But here's the thing. If he had never got to that point of absolute need, if he had never been stone broke, if he had never needed to call out to that gent in desperation, he would never have discovered the riches that were now his. Well, in the same way, it is only when we see that we are spiritually stone broke, when we recognize that there's nothing that we can do to earn favor with God, that we can throw ourselves on God's mercy. And when we do that, God gives us more than we could possibly imagine. Look at verse 3 again. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This takes my mind to the words of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, where we read this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In Christ, we are heirs to the kingdom of heaven. There's never been a better time to realize that we are spiritually stone broke. No wonder Jesus said that there's blessing, there's happiness for those who are poor in spirit. Have you recognized your spiritual poverty? Do you realize that you can bring nothing to God's party? Nothing but a broken heart and a spirit that cries, Father, I need you. True happiness comes from depending on God because we are spiritually stone broke. And moving on to verse four then. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now this doesn't sound very promising either. How is mourning the path to happiness? Now first of all, it is worth just noting that Jesus is probably not talking about the mourning we experience when a loved one dies. Far more likely, and in keeping with themes that recur through the Old Testament, this mourning is because of the brokenness of our relationship with God. A brokenness that comes from our rebellion against him, rebellion that we call sin. So how can tears shed over our sin lead to happiness? 
you know what? I think this is maybe the best news this morning. Come with me to Isaiah chapter 40. And in Isaiah chapter 40, we read the following words. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her forced labor has been completed. Her iniquity has been pardoned, for she has received from the hand of the Lord double for all her sins. How does God comfort Israel? By proclaiming forgiveness. Comfort comes in knowing the forgiveness of sins. Those who mourn over their sin, those who recognize that they are rebels, those who turn to God will be comforted. God will proclaim our sins are forgiven. What could be better than knowing that despite our failures, despite our sin, we're forgiven? God will not hold our sin against us. Do you see what great comfort this is? Can you see that this is a happiness that is way beyond anything that the world has to offer? You see, it is happiness that is not dependent on the size of the surf or the quality of your golf swing, the flavor of your food, or the relationships that surround you. This is true happiness that comes from God. I wonder how much happiness we derive from knowing our sins are forgiven. Maybe we don't derive much happiness because we've become comfortable in our sin. We don't take sin seriously enough so it doesn't bother us, which means in turn we aren't constantly grateful and in awe of God's forgiveness. Maybe we are not as happy as we could be because we are not as mournful as we should be. True happiness comes from depending on God for his comfort that comes from knowing our sins are forgiven. Moving then to verse five. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. As someone said to me the other day, the world says might is right and meek is weak. But the reality is meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power that is restrained. Now, something that has unfortunately been a lack, distinct lack of in recent days. And and I mean that in in numerous ways, but never more so than in the tragic murder of George Floyd in the US. Had those officers demonstrated even a shred of meekness, he would probably still be alive today. An abuse of power led to death. You see, meekness is the very opposite of abusing power. It is to hold back. Now, Jesus is, of course, the perfect example of meekness. You see, Jesus had all the power in the world and yet allowed himself to be killed. He was meek for the sake of the kingdom. He was meek for your sake and for mine. He gave his life that we might live. And we are called to follow his examples. We should be those who are happy to get on with living godly lives, not pushing and shoving to make it to the top at all costs. And if we are those who are in a position of power, we are to use that power wisely. Use it in a godly way. Use it to advance God's agenda and not our own. For the reward of the meek is great. They will inherit the earth. You see, contrary to the way society operates today, where the mighty seem to rule the world, the meek, they are the true heirs. True happiness comes from depending on God in meekness because those on God's side will ultimately inherit the earth. Verse six, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. Hunger and thirst speak of our appetites, our desires. What are we to desire if we want to be truly happy? The answer is righteousness. We are to hunger and thirst after the only thing that can really satisfy. We saw last week in Psalm 1 verse 2 that those who are blessed, those are the ones that delight in the law of the Lord and on his law meditate day and night. Happiness comes from delighting in knowing God and knowing his ways. And the wonderful news is that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. So our delight is in him. He is the one who satisfies our hunger, our thirst for righteousness. 
Jesus says in John 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus is the only one who can satisfy. So the question we must ask at this point is, where are we looking for our satisfaction? What will make us happy? Do we chase after satisfaction in our hobbies, our sports, our relationships? Now, don't get me wrong, there's joy and happiness to be had in all those things, but they cannot ultimately satisfy. My own experience has borne that out. At the moment, I'm quite into surfing, as you may have noticed already. When I have a good surf, I come home and I'm buzzing. But within five minutes, I'm back on my phone looking at the forecast to see when will there next be waves? When will the next buzz come? When we hunger and thirst of Jesus, after Jesus, the buzz isn't temporary. The happiness isn't fleeting. Jesus promises us that we will be satisfied. True happiness comes from depending on God because only Jesus can satisfy. To summarize the first point, true happiness comes from depending on God. Depending on God because we are spiritually stone broke. Depending on God for his comfort, that comes from knowing our sins are forgiven. Depending on God in meekness because those on God's side will ultimately inherit the earth. Depending on God because only Jesus can satisfy. True happiness comes from depending on God. And it follows that if true happiness comes from depending on God, then a life lived for God should bring true happiness too. And so we come to our second point. True happiness comes from living for God. Verses 7 to 9. Verse 7. Blessed are those who, uh, sorry, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Jesus isn't talking about the occasional act of mercy, but a life committed to showing mercy to others. As those who have received the extravagant mercy of God's forgiveness, we live lives that overflow with mercy. And the promise here is that those who show mercy will receive mercy. Now, there's an element to which that is true in everyday life. But this promise has a future aspect. Because those who are showing mercy will receive in full God's mercy at the final judgment. Where our sins will not be held against us, but rather God who is rich in mercy and abounding in love will welcome us as his dearly loved children. If we don't show mercy, we show that we have not understood God's mercy towards us. I wonder if you remember the parable that Jesus told of the unmerciful servant. In brief, it goes like this. A man owes his master an absolute fortune. He pleads with the master and the master says, your debt is canceled. That same man leaves the master and finds a guy who owes him a small amount of money. He insists that this guy pays him, and when he can't, he has him locked up. He shows no mercy at all. When the master finds out, he's outraged, and he has the man locked up. Let's not be like that man. But rather, as those who have received mercy from God, let us extend mercy to others. What does that look like in practice? Well, we need to be those who are quick to forgive. Those who treat others kindly, not as they sometimes even deserve, but with great mercy. True happiness comes from being merciful, for we shall receive mercy. And moving on then to verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The word pure has a sense of clean, unstained, guiltless, innocent, upright, a pure heart. And heart has a sense of our whole being, who we are, the very center of our moral being. J.C. Ryle, when commentating about this verse, said this. Those who are pure in heart, he says, they are not satisfied with a mere external show of religion. They strive to have always a conscience void of offense and to serve God with the spirit and the inner man. What we have here is a wholehearted, deep-rooted, Commitment to living God's way in his world. The associated blessing is that we will see God. 
in the present that is best understood as seeing God in the sense of knowing and understanding him. If we have a heart that is wholeheartedly committed to living for God, we will know God in a more intimate way than those who are not committed to him. This is how relationships work, isn't it? You see, I see Amy, my wife, in a very different way to anyone else. I know her. I think that's the way we're supposed to understand seeing God in the present. Beyond this life, the application is far more straightforward. Those who have a pure heart will see God. We will enter into his presence. We will live with him for all eternity. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read this, I do feel like there's very little chance of me gaining happiness because of the pureness of my heart. But thankfully, Psalm 59 has a prayer for us. Psalm 59, 10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. We need God to do a work in our hearts to have a pure heart. You see, there is no detergent strong enough to clean our hearts. This is something that only God can do. And praise God that he sent Jesus to do just that. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is 1 John 1 verse 9. Because it says this, If we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Through Jesus, God makes us clean. Therefore, let us strive to live lives of those who have a pure heart. True happiness comes from being from true happiness comes from being pure in heart. Then on to verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Isn't this a word we need to hear today? It seems to me if we look around the world, there is a desperate need for peacemakers. Those who seek to bring people together and not to divide. We need those who actively seek to overcome evil with good. Now that might sound like a job for just a few, but the reality is that all Christians are called to be peacemakers. Because you see, being a peacemaker can be as simple as being the person who reacts calmly when provoked. It can be saying to a brother or sister in Christ, hey, that, that thing you said to so and so, that wasn't kind, that wasn't okay. Why don't you go and say sorry to them? It can be saying sorry when we mess up and hurt other people. You see, the truth is, if we're going to see peace on a grand scale, it will come from a place of peace on a small scale. More importantly, it will come from a peace that we have with God. When we are peacemakers, we reflect the characteristics of our heavenly Father. And consequently, peacemakers are called sons of God. Sons as those who are members of God's family. I mean, I don't think it's too hard to see why the path to happiness involves making peace. I wonder if you've ever been at that rather awkward dinner where the husband and wife start having a go at each other. All of a sudden, there's a tension in the air that you could cut with a knife. A happy time has turned sour so quickly. But if peace is restored, the happiness of the occasion returns. True happiness comes from being peacemakers. So true happiness comes from depending on God. True happiness comes from living for God. And finally, and very briefly, true happiness comes from suffering for God. Reading from verse 10. Blessed are you, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Be happy when you are suffering persecution. Really? Why? Well, here's why. Because suffering persecution is evidence that we are on Jesus' side. Before we get to that, let's just make sure we have a few things straight. There is happiness to be had when we are persecuted for righteousness' sake. When we face opposition or difficulty, when we are treated unfairly because we are followers of Jesus pursuing righteousness' 
You see, there's no happiness to be had if the persecution we face is because we're obnoxious, ungracious, judgmental, and just generally unpleasant. Unfortunately, over time, all too many Christians have displayed these attitudes almost looking to be persecuted, and then they think there's some honor in the persecution that they receive. No, that's misguided. There is only honor if the persecution comes as we live righteous lives. Or verse 11 again, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. When we suffer because we are Christians, there is reason to rejoice and be glad, for our reward is great in heaven. And here's the thing, when we are suffering for living with Jesus, we join a long line of people who have been rejected because they were on God's side. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Do you see how persecution puts us in great company? We are named among the prophets, the people God had chosen to speak his word to his people. And as Christians, we are called to speak God's word into his world through the words that we say and the way that we live. And when we do that, we will face persecution. We're very fortunate to live in Jersey in a relatively tolerant society. So we're unlikely to face the persecution some Christians have faced in the past and still face today. For us, the worst we're likely to face is a bit of social awkwardness. Maybe we don't get added to the work WhatsApp group. Maybe we do, and then we get mocked for our faith. It might be that family members members treat us badly because we believe in Jesus. But by and large, on the grand scheme of things, the persecution we might face is pretty low level. Sure, from time to time, it can be worse. We can find it extremely hard, which may lead us to question, where is the happiness in suffering? Well, it's a bit like this. Most of you, I'm sure, know Roy. Roy plays for the Jersey Reds rugby team. Now, admittedly, there's not a lot of rugby going on at the moment, but hopefully that'll all be back to normal soon. Anyway, before lockdown, if Roy was to walk into church with a black eye the day after match day, a match which they had won, how do you think he would feel about that black eye? I can tell you, he would be proud of it. Now, is that because he's some kind of a nutter who likes getting hurt? No, of course not. He'd be wearing it with pride because it shows, it's proof that he was in the thick of things. He was where the action was at. He was at the heart of the game. This wound would feel strangely worth it. Well, in just the same way, when we are persecuted for righteousness, when we are rejected on account of Jesus, we can take joy from our suffering because it is evidence that we're on the right side. We're where the action is. Now, it's true, we might not carry many wounds here in Jersey. And it might actually not be because we are not seeking to live righteous lives because of the society that we live in. Of course, it could be that we're just compromising left, right, and center. But it might not be. We do need to seek to live righteous lives and be ready to face whatever persecution might come our way. And when it does, we can think to ourselves, yes, it's because I'm on Jesus' side. And we can derive great happiness despite the pain and discomfort of the suffering. True happiness comes from suffering for God because it is evidence that we are on on Jesus' side. So as we draw to a close, I, I want to go back to the finish the sentence that we started with. I will next achieve a state of happiness by... Do you remember your answer from some 20 odd minutes ago? Would you change any of it in light of what you've heard this morning? You see, if we want to find true happiness, our answers should go something like this. I will next achieve a state of happiness by depending on God. I will next achieve a state of happiness by living for God. I will next achieve a state of happiness by suffering for God. Do you want to be happy? Depend on God. Live for him. Suffer for him. And you will know happiness beyond your wildest dream. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a great God, a powerful God, an almighty God. We thank you that you really can delight our hearts. You can give us happiness beyond what we can imagine, both in this life, and Lord, the happiness that we long for in the future is even greater than anything we could possibly believe. So Father, we thank you 
that through you we can have great joy, great delight, and great happiness. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus to wash us, to purify us, that we might come into your presence, that we might be welcomed into your family as those who have a pure heart through your pure and perfect Son. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing to God and praise his name in the next few songs.